I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. Today on ABC News Live, the urgent search for more than a dozen people after extreme flooding and landslides. Virginia's governor has declared a state of emergency. More than 100 homes have been damaged, with many knocked off their foundations. What first responders are saying about the growing search and rescue efforts. Also ahead, Brittany Griner returns to court after pleading guilty to drug charges in Russia. What we've just learned about the witnesses who testified at today's hearing. And Russia has launched a new series of missile strikes in Ukraine. We'll have the latest on the death toll and the response from Ukraine's president from our foreign correspondent in Ukraine. But we begin with the state of emergency in Virginia and the search for more than a dozen people still unaccounted for after devastating flooding there. The local sheriff says crews worked through the night to help find and reunite residents with their loved ones. Trevor Alt starts us off from Western Virginia. The desperate search for people still unaccounted for after flash floods ripped through Western Virginia. Houses in the road, and it's just a mess. The governor declaring a state of emergency in Buchanan County after six inches of rain fell in just 90 minutes. This pickup hanging on a riverbank, its windshield shattered. Drone video capturing the extent of the damage from the fast moving floodwaters. People lost everything. At least 100 homes suffering severe damage, many lines of communication knocked offline. We were stranded in the house. The water kept coming up. First responders say accessing homes in the remote area has been a struggle for search and rescue teams. And in Maryland, winds taking down trees, knocking them onto cars and power lines. I don't know if it was lightning striking or wind, or but it just was down. And the electrical lines were down, and there's a fire on the fence. Homes knocked right off their foundations. I was sleeping there earlier today. I could have died. Charlotte, North Carolina, heavy rain triggering flash floods in several counties. Well, in Ohio, violent storms ripping through the Toledo area. And Diane, officials are stressing all those people who are unaccounted for are not considered missing. They just haven't been able to contact them yet, given all the spotty cell service here and the down power lines, too. But of course, with the extent of this damage, officials make sure they want to find these people and contact them as soon as they can. Diane. Understandable. Trevor Alt in Western Virginia, thank you. And the new jobs report is showing 244,000 Americans filed for unemployment benefits last week, 9,000 more than the week before. It comes as inflation is soaring. Prices rose 1.3 percent from May to June and 9.1 percent over the past year. That's the highest in more than 40 years. In some areas of the country, the inflation rate is now above 10 percent. Whit Johnson has the latest on that. Growing fears of a possible recession as inflation hits a near 41 year high. Prices in June soaring 9.1% compared to a year ago, higher than economists expected. Big increases impacting just about everything from food to rent to energy. We were using majority of our paychecks just to afford gas. The average household spending $493 more per month for the same goods they bought a year ago, according to Moody's Analytics. Grocery prices rising at their fastest pace since 19. 1979, up more than 12 percent. No matter where I shop, prices are just so much higher than ever before. In June, a dozen eggs cost $2.71, up from $1.64 a year ago. A gallon of milk, $4.15 last month, up from $3.56. I'm looking at prices more, and I'm not buying things that's not needed, like junk food. More families needing assistance, too, struggling to put food on the table. Our Victor Okendo is in South Florida. This is a food distribution site in Miami Gardens, a vital lifeline for families, and the demand is skyrocketing. Take a look at the line. It stretches for about a mile. Bank of America now forecasting the U.S. will fall into a mild recession this year. Despite growing wages for workers, economists say they're losing ground to inflation. Real wages, when you adjust for inflation, are down 3.6 percent. That means for most workers, for the average worker, they're not even treading water. Wages are not keeping pace with price increases. But there are some hopeful signs. Gas prices starting to come down and prices are cooling on popular electronics. The cost of smartphones fell 20 percent in June from a year ago. TV is down 12.7 percent. Now on inflation, some economists are predicting that the Federal Reserve will get even more aggressive now to try to offset these rising prices, possibly with a supersized rate hike as high as a full percentage point later this month. Diane. A supersized rate hike. Whit Johnson, thank you. 
And those gas prices Whit mentioned, they've been falling steadily over the past four weeks. It's the longest price decline since the start of the pandemic in early 2020. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman has more on that. Hi, Matt. You know, we saw that inflation report, gas prices, major culprit in rising consumer prices. And you look at that sign behind me, you're thinking, 625 a gallon for gas? That can't be good. But AAA is reporting 29 consecutive days of gas prices going down nationally. National average peaked at just over $5 a gallon a month ago. Now it's at 460. Um, that is still a lot higher than it was a year ago when it was about 314 a gallon. Um, but we are seeing gas stations across the country bring prices down. This one down 45 cents just over the past couple of weeks. A lot of this has to do with the reduction in global oil prices due to an economic slowdown worldwide. And economists are telling us don't cheer just yet, no popping of champagne. Uh, and that is because we could still see record prices in August if there is political turmoil in the Middle East or if a hurricane hits a city with oil refineries. So uh, we're not out of the woods just yet, but certainly getting closer. Diane. All right, Matt Gutman, thank you. Brittany Griner is back in a Russian court today after pleading guilty to drug charges last week. The WNBA star and two-time Olympic gold medalist did not take the stand as expected, but character witnesses did testify on her behalf. Griner has said she wants to plead guilty. She had no intention, she says, of breaking Russian law and didn't mean to pack vape cartridges with hashish oil in her luggage. Now the Biden administration is coming under increasing pressure to bring Griner home as she could face a sentence of up to 10 years in a Russian prison. Senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel joins me live now, along with White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for more. Ian, what do we know about these character witnesses who testified today and, and what did they have to say? Yeah, first of all, I think it's important to remember this trial has been going on uh, for weeks now, and this was the third hearing and only lasted a number of hours. But I think important character testimony. Uh, firstly, we heard from Maxim Rybakov. He's the director of UMC. That's the Russian basketball club in the city of Ekaterinburg for which uh, Griner played in the WNBA uh, off-season. Uh, he was the first witness. What he said was that Griner is, quote, an outstanding basketball player. He said that she had a break in January and that's why she'd gone back for the US. And I think this is important because he also said that she had planned to come back in February. Now, clearly, if this had been willful in some way, that would perhaps suggest that you know, she wasn't going to come back. She wouldn't have carried out, uh, carried these vape cartridges uh, through. But that certainly would seem to be the intent, saying, look, she liked Russia, she came to Russia, she was leaving to go back to the US in the off-season, but she was going to come back anyway. Um, he uh, also said that despite the US notification to Americans not to travel to Russia. Remember, she was arrested one week after the start of the war, uh, that she came back because she was feeling confident. The second witness uh, was a team doctor, Anatoly Galabin. Uh, and what, she, uh, what he said was at the beginning of February, um, Griner had mild coronavirus, said that she had had a number of these uh, doping tests that all the players go through, that she'd never tested positive while playing for the team. The third witness uh, was Yevgenia Belyevikov. And this was a fellow teammate. She said she'd known Brittany for seven years and described Brittany as the leader of the team. Diane? Uh, Brian, it sounds like this is kind of the equivalent of the U.S. sentencing portion of a trial. Brittany Griner already pleaded guilty. So how important is it to hear these people come and testify to her character? And how important is it for her to take the stand? I think it's extremely important because what a judge or anyone else wants to see is the connection of the dots. We've already heard these initial character witnesses kind of paint the picture of who Brittany Griner is. What a judge would want to see, whether it be a, a sentencing phase in America or what we're seeing play out in Russia, is her testimony connecting the dots, showing the, the leadership that her teammates have, have said that she has showed on the court and off the court, and also, to, for lack of a better phrase, her kind of throwing herself on the sword, saying, yes. I brought these hashish oils. I didn't intend to do it. I didn't knowingly commit this crime, but this is who I am and this is what I need out of you. So Mary Alice, veteran negotiator and former New Mexico governor Bill Richardson is headed to Moscow trying to secure Reiner, Griner's release. What's the strategy there and what could a potential deal look like? 
Yeah, Diane, I think it's important to remember that U.S. officials are highly skeptical that Griner is going to get any semblance of a fair trial. It's just not what they expect in Russia's court. Russia's court. It's not what they uh, are. What, it's what they're worried about. They're worried is that she is being treated, uh, that she's been wrongfully detained, that she could be treated as a political hostage. That this is all just a big stunt uh, for Putin, for for the politics of this moment. And so they are trying to put all hands on deck here. They're saying that they are working as aggressively as possible to secure her release if, in fact, she doesn't get, uh, you know, if she if she's found guilty, if she's sentenced. Um, they want to make sure that they're continuing any negotiations regardless and separate from this trial. You know, Bill Richardson, he has experience with this kind of really sensitive and delicate negotiations. Uh, he helped uh, with the, he reportedly helped with the negotiations of the release of the former Marine Trevor Reed, who was a part of that prisoner exchange just back in April. I think there's a lot of questions, a lot of um, a lot of uh, a lot of wonder about whether we could really be looking at another possible prisoner exchange in this case. And of course, uh, the White House saying not only is he going to negotiate on behalf of her, but also uh, Paul Whelan, another American that the U.S. has said is wrongfully detained. Now, Ian, Brittany Griner has been detained for nearly five months now. LeBron James is now just the latest person to try to address how challenging and how difficult that must be for her. She's six foot nine. So what do we know about the conditions uh, where she's being held? Yeah, I mean, I think there are two key points. The first one is the, the general notoriety of Russian prisons. They are notorious uh, for being very difficult places where there is violence, where there is mistreatment, where there is disease, where there are unsanitary conditions. Uh, we've heard from other high-profile political, uh, Russian political prisoners who've been detained in these prisoners, uh, and frankly, they sound like hellholes. Now, we haven't heard that from Griner. What she said, there was this letter, uh, this draft letter that appeared on Independence Day, July the 4th, in which she said, I'm terrified I might be here forever. But I think, interestingly, she didn't describe her conditions as being appalling in the way that we've heard testimony from other prisoners in other prisons. Uh, and there's no suggestion that she's been, that she's been mistreated. But, of course, uh, as Mary Alice says, the Biden administration is saying not only that she has been wrongfully detained, but that she is held under, quote, intolerable conditions. Now, Brian, Griner could face up to 10 years in a Russian prison, which, given Ian's context, adds even more gravity to that. So how does the legal system there work? What are the chances are of her getting a reduced sentence? So the legal system is a lot different than what we have in the United States, which is an adversarial system. If someone's accused of a crime, that person has a defense attorney who's not really a part of the system, but is actually fighting against it for the best interest of their clients. Very different here in Russia. It's more of a gathering of information type situation, but that gathering of information is in large part led by the government. And part of the reason why she's pleading guilty is because of that ability to negotiate an exchange between her or another um, Russian detainee or Russian uh, incarcerated person in the United States. And so when you think about the chances of her actually winning, Russia has a 99% conviction rate. They don't typically have people get acquitted or have lower sentences, but this is the best hope based on what she's doing now. 99% conviction rate. All right, Ian Panel, Mary Alice Parks, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you all. And 17 people are dead, about 90 more wounded after a Russian missile hit a city in central Ukraine. President Zelensky called the attack an open act of terrorism against civilians in locations he says have no military value. ABC foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge is in Ukraine traveling to Venetia with the latest. Hi, Tom. Yeah, Diane, this is yet another brutal attack mid-morning in a city called Vinitsa. It's southwest of Kiev. It's just south of here. We're on our way there right now. The death toll rising throughout the morning. Officials at late morning into the afternoon saying that about 20 people at least have been killed. Uh, about 50 people are known to be seriously injured. And this is a city well away from the fighting in the east. This is a city where a lot of Ukrainian families have moved to get away from the fighting, to try and get to relative safety. Uh, Zelensky, President Zelensky today calling this yet another act of Russian terrorism. Diane? All right, Tom Sufi Burridge for us in Ukraine. Thanks, Tom. And Israeli President Isaac Herzog is about to award President Biden with the Israeli Presidential Medal of Honor. It comes as Biden wraps up his visit in Israel today. The president met with leaders from India, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Israel at the I2U2 summit, calling it an opportunity 
to find common solutions to issues like climate change, economic stress, and the COVID-19 pandemic. There you can see President Biden with the Israeli president, and again, getting ready for the Israeli president to award the president with that Medal of Honor. Our political director, deputy political director, Avery Harper, joins me live from Jerusalem with more on all of this. Uh, Avery, it looks like maybe he was actually just awarded um, that medal. Hey, what's the latest there, and how important is this recognition for the U.S.-Israeli alliance? Right. Well, this trip is a, a lot about uh, reaffirming the U.S.'s support for uh, Israel uh, and uh, creating bonds and ties between Israel and other uh, Arab nations in, in the region. And it's all about uh, creating cooperation to uh, tackle some large challenges, including the fallout and the impact of uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, about uh, climate change, food security issues, again, tied to uh, the Russian war in Ukraine. And so uh, there are many issues that are on the agenda for for President Biden as he meets with leaders today. Now, the president also participated in that first leaders summit. What more do we know about that meeting and this new partnership? Right. Again, it's about uh, creating cooperation within the region to tackle some of these large challenges. We know that tomorrow uh, the, the president is going to meet with the Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas before he heads over to Saudi Arabia, where he's going to be meeting with uh, other leaders, including uh, Saudi leaders, uh, including Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And again, it's about creating cooperation within the, the region for uh, things like uh, tackling the uh, progress of Iran's nuclear program. That's something that we talked about a little bit earlier today when we saw uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Lapid and uh, President Biden sign a declaration in which they uh, both committed uh, to do everything in their power to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Now, the president uh, met with the president of Israel. Uh, he's with him right now. He's also meeting with the former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. What do we know about what was discussed there and how carefully does President Biden need to tread given the current political climate in Israel? Right. Uh, in November, uh, as Americans are heading to the polls uh, for midterms, Israelis are going to be heading to the polls for uh, their fifth election since uh, April 2019. And so uh, in an effort to stay above the political fray, so to speak, uh, we will see, uh, we have seen uh, President Biden meet with both uh, the current Prime Minister Lapid uh, and also the leader of the opposition, uh, former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, and uh, it's, again, about creating uh, and reaffirming that connection between the two nations because regardless of who becomes the prime minister after November's elections, uh, these are objectives that uh, the Biden administration wants to pursue regardless of who's in office. All right, our deputy political director, Avery Harper, in Jerusalem for us. Thanks, Avery. Coming up, new major developments in the political upheaval in Sri Lanka. The latest move from the country's president after he fled the country. Stay with us. Welcome back. According to an aide to the parliament speaker, the president of Sri Lanka has officially announced his resignation. This comes after protests against the economy came to a head over the weekend. ABC's foreign correspondent Maggie Rooley takes a look at the months of protests. Three months into a relentless crisis. <laughs> the sounds of piano keys. The sight of families playing in the pool and people exercising at the president's private gym. Peaceful moments amid the disarray of a democracy's downfall. A week of political chaos. Protesters in Sri Lanka taking over the president's home, his office, the residence of the prime minister. <laughs> Fed up, angered by the country's worst economic crisis since its independence from Britain in 1948. <laughs> President Gotabaya Raya Paksa, part of a family that's dominated Sri Lankan politics for decades, fleeing to the Maldives. A 
nation that once had a promising future, high levels of education and a solid middle class falling into pieces, inflation levels reaching a record of 54%, a $7 billion debt leaving the country unable to pay for imports of food, fuel, or medicine, and what is left is increasingly unaffordable. Schools have been closed to save fuel. People are traveling long distances by foot. Pharmacies have run out of over-the-counter medicines. Just last month, the United Nations warning that more than a quarter of Sri Lanka's nearly 22 million people are at risk of food shortages. Life in Sri Lanka completely upended. And this, the protesters' last resort. The air conditions are running in that presidential palace while people don't have electricity in their homes. The people of Sri Lanka putting an end to Ariyapaksha's family's dynasty, which has ruled the nation for the last two decades. The opposition parties trying to find a successor, but protesters demand popular elections. And for the first time in months, they feel they might succeed. I definitely want both to resign and I think a new regime needs to come into place. For past six months, people were struggling in the uh, queues, people are in the fuel queues, people are in the gas queues, but now um, people have hope. All right, our thanks to Maggie Ruley for that report. Coming up, the FDA has greenlighted a fourth brand of COVID vaccine. Who can get the shot and the technology behind them when we come back? Welcome back to ABC News Live. The FDA has granted emergency authorization for a fourth COVID vaccine. The Novavax vaccine is based on a more traditional protein-based technology, similar to the flu shot. Instead of mRNA, it's now authorized for people over the age of 18. More than 500 women are suing Uber, claiming sexual assault by drivers. Last month, the company released a safety report revealing nearly 1,000 sexual assault incidents reported in 2020 alone. The suit claims the company prioritizes growth over customer safety. Uber responded in a statement saying they can't comment on pending litigation. And U.S. women's national soccer player Carson Pickett is making history this year as the first person with a limb difference to play for the national team. Pickett says she's made it her goal to be a role model. And as we celebrate Disability Pride Month, ABC's George Stephanopoulos brings us her story. The United States of America are crowned champions of the world. It is one of the most dominant teams in all of sports, the U.S. women's soccer team. Some of the biggest names in the game have worn the USA shirt. Carson Pickett making her senior national team debut. Julie now we can add a new name to the long list of greats, Carson Pickett. The 28-year-old recently made history in a friendly game, helping the team in its 2-0 shutout of Columbia. She's the first player with a limb difference to earn a U.S. women's national team cap. The South Carolina native was born without a left hand and forearm, but that didn't stop her from taking up soccer, which she's played since five. The Trailblazer now plays for the North Carolina Courage in the National Women's Soccer League. But Pickett also made headlines in 2019 when this photo went viral. She made a special connection with Joseph Tidd, a boy in the stands, also born with a limb difference. Who's your favorite player? Uh, Carson. Carson is making an impact both on and off the field, hoping to raise awareness about limb difference while inspiring future generations to pursue their dreams. Our thanks to George Stephanopoulos for that. And I'm Diane Macedo. Do stay with us as ABC News Live continues with more news, context, and analysis right after this. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.